everybody, Dr. R here. In this video, we're gonna talk about the cardiac function curves. We'll also talk about the venous return curves. And then what we'll do is we're gonna overlay these two curves. And that's where some of these questions come from. And I'd say this is probably one of the most um, you know, confusing topics for some students. So we're gonna try and simplify it in this video. So let's start off with the cardiac function curve, okay? So just to kind of talk a little bit about this curve, what we're doing is, you know, if you remember when we did the Frank Starling curve, we had on the Frank Starling curve, we had, you know, left ventricular end diastolic pressure or left ventricular end diastolic volume or essentially some marker of preload down here in the x-axis and in the y-axis we had stroke volume okay so that's what we did for the frank starling curve so we looked at the relationship between preload and stroke volume now when we're talking about these cardiac function curves they're actually you know a lot of the same we're going to put our right atrial pressure here i'm going to put rap right atrial pressure and then in the y-axis we're going to have our cardiac output Okay, so remember stroke volume times the heart rate is equal to the cardiac output. You know, this is somewhat indicative of what we saw when we looked at the Frank Sterling curve because these two variables are proportional to each other. So what we're going to do with this curve is we're going to change the right atrial pressure and see how that affects the cardiac output. And I think you can kind of guess where this is going if you watch the last video. So let's have a cardiac output. Remember we said the kind of the average normal cardiac output is going to be about five liters per minute. So I'm just gonna put a five there. And you know, right atrial pressure typically will be close to zero. And so I'm gonna put a point kind of right here between these two. So at a cardiac output of about five liters, we have you know a close to zero right atrial pressure. If I were to plot this out, right atrial pressure for a given cardiac output, it would look something like this. Okay, in other words, as the right atrial pressure goes up, as the right atrial pressure goes up, the cardiac output is also going to go up. And that makes sense, right? Because again, this goes back to preload. It's the same thing we talked about with the Frank Starling mechanism. I have more blood coming back to the heart. That's going to increase the myofiber stretch, the sarcomere length, and that's going to help increase the contractility, the force of contraction, and all that extra preload is going to be more blood moving out of the heart, right? That's going to increase the stroke volume, subsequently increasing the cardiac output. Okay, so that's the concept. That's really what this cardiac function curve is saying. So as I move up and down this curve, we can see as my right atrial pressure increases, let's say this is, I don't know, five, right? My cardiac output is going to increase. Okay, so that's the concept. If I move down the curve, lower right atrial pressures or more negative right atrial pressures, right, my cardiac output is going to be lower. Now, just like with the Frank Starling curve, we talked about how we could uh, enhance or depress the curve. So a depressed curve would be a curve that kind of runs at a lower slope. Okay, I'm just drawing something out here. So this would be a curve that has depressed, and what's depressed here? It's a cardiac function curve. It's going to be depressed cardiac function. Okay, so this is going to be the depressed curve. And there are really three variables at play that can depress cardiac function. So the first one here is contractility. So if my contractility goes down, that's going to cause the curve to shift down. Think about that. At a given right atrial pressure, okay, so let's take our same right atrial pressure pretty close to zero. So right atrial pressure around zero is going to give me a lower cardiac output. That makes sense. If I have less contractility, I'm going to get less cardiac output at a given right atrial pressure. What about heart rate? Same concept, if my heart rate goes down, right? If my heart rate goes down, I'm gonna have a lower cardiac output. Look at the equation. If heart rate comes down, cardiac output is gonna come down. Okay, so that's gonna shift the curve downward. Now, after load, you might have to think about this one a little bit. So remember, after load is gonna be synonymous with the total peripheral resistance. The thing is, if the TPR goes up, if I have you know mass vasoconstriction, right? So if the TPR goes up or if the afterload goes up, my cardiac output is actually going to go down because the stroke volume has to kind of fight against that afterload. And if that afterload is higher, I'm gonna get less forward stroke volume, less cardiac output. And we talked a lot about this in the last video, so you can always reference that. But the idea here is, is the cardiac output is gonna be inversely proportional to the afterload. Therefore, a higher afterload a higher afterload will actually move the curve to the right. Okay, it'll depress the cardiac function curve. Now, on the other hand, if we had increased contractility or increased heart rate or decreased afterload, that would shift the curve the opposite direction. 
okay? So that would shift the curve in the left direction, enhancing cardiac function. So I'd have a higher cardiac output for a given right atrial pressure. So as I said earlier, this is very similar to what we saw when we talked about the Frank Starling curve. There's not a lot of huge differences between the two up to this point. 